Hi, my name is Tim Naftali. I'm director of the Richard Nixon Presidential Library and Museum in Yorba Linda, California. It's my honor and privilege to be interviewing Jeff Shepard for a second time. Uh, it's uh, May 26, 2009. Jeff, thank you for doing this for the oral history program. Uh, we're going to talk about what you did um, at the White House that touched on Watergate, uh, the issue of the president's defense, the tapes, and that sort of thing. Um, when does the shadow of Watergate start to um, be well, it, it, uh, it, in my view, uh, it starts with the release of the Pentagon Papers. Uh, but just a little bit before that, it starts with the hiring of Gordon Liddy. Uh, I was Bud's principal deputy. Uh, uh, there were uh, uh, lots of people who reported to Bud, but they basically were, were I, I had a say in almost everything. Uh, he had a lot of faith in me and gave me a lot of latitude. Uh, there was this war between the Department of Justice and the Treasury over drug abuse, and uh, uh, Bud was supporting the Department of Justice. Uh, and, and the people that he was opposing uh, had to do with a guy named Gene Rosides, who was Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for law enforcement. And under Gene was alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, ATF. Uh, uh, and as a special assistant to Gene was G. Gordon Liddy. Uh, and Gordon Liddy was a political appointee at the Department of Treasury responsible for the care and feeding of uh, people in favor of the ownership and uh, uh, control of firearms, uh, which are in opposition to alcohol, tobacco, and firearms that tends to want to put restraints on, on gun ownership. Uh, and Liddy uh, was, was the gun advocate within the administration. And there would be battles uh, uh, over uh, policy making. And they tended to center on Liddy uh, because Liddy would give speeches that were not authorized by the, the Department of Treasury because they ran the enforcement organization. They didn't need someone out giving speeches that was critical of the enforcement operation. And Gene Rossitis uh, was over both of these people. And it got so bad that uh, uh, they were going to fire uh, Liddy. They are going to let him go because he was causing so much trouble in his advocacy of, of uh, uh, the interests of gun owners. Uh, the Department of Justice had every interest in feeding this controversy. And there was one particular gentleman uh, who was uh, Don Santarelli, who was Associate Deputy Attorney General. He was one of the three direct reports to Dick Kleindienst, who was Deputy Attorney General. Uh, Don thought that it was a direct insult to the White House for Gordon Liddy to be relieved and told Bud and told Bud and told Bud and, and said that uh, uh, the only way to, to trump Treasury was for Bud to hire Gordon onto his own staff. Now, I had been at Treasury as a White House fellow. I was familiar with Gordon Liddy and I knew uh, the difficulties that he had caused, and I was strongly opposed to Gordon joining Bud's staff. Uh, I didn't think we needed someone who had such a well-defined point of advocacy on what was supposed to be the neutral organization. Uh, so there was this clash between two trusted confidants of Bud Grove, Don Santarelli, his primary contact at the Department of Justice, and me, his principal staff guy even to the point where uh, Bud agreed that we would take a couple of hours, go off-site to a particular coffee shop so I would have the <clears throat> option, the opportunity, to fully articulate my opposition to Gordon coming on the staff. And, and I went through it, uh, that he was a field general, uh, that he was, he was far too much of an advocate that, that, that would require massive supervision. Uh, that he brought with him a lot of troubles and the enmity of, of the Treasury, and he wouldn't fit. He was just not the kind of person that, that we, we needed on the domestic council. Uh, uh, I was given my hearing, uh, and to my everlasting regret, I lost. Uh, after Gordon joined the staff, and, and in his book, Will, he says that when he was first brought on the staff, I very kindly showed him the ropes and told him how things worked and because he had ideas and I showed him how we did it. You know, we put it mm -hmm. in writing and that sort of thing. 
But shortly thereafter, the Pentagon Papers leaked. Uh, 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 Daniel Ellsberg uh, got them, uh, gave them, and they were printed by the New York Times. <coughs> it turned out Ellsberg, uh, who had worked for Rand Corporation, had 75,000 pages of other classified information. Uh, the government didn't know what to do. The Pentagon Papers themselves were compiled under the Johnson administration, about the Johnson administration, and it was how did we get into the Vietnam War? What mistakes did we make? Nixon was not at risk. But Henry Kissinger was in every day saying, I can't conduct secret diplomacy if people think stuff's going to leak, <clears throat> and we don't know what else he's got, and it may hurt you. So Nixon, I think out of the finest of motives, felt he had to take aggressive action to stem government leaks. He had to defend the integrity of the previous administration it stands in startling contrast with what's going on today. But Nixon rose to the fight on the Pentagon Papers out of loyalty to Johnson as president, not because he agreed with the policies. He was defending the presidency. There are books written about this. He, he calls people in, demands an organization. The organization is very public. It becomes called the Plumbers. Uh, Bud Krogh is appointed from the domestic side, law enforcement. Uh, he has a counterpart, a co-chair, David Young, who's Henry Kissinger's aide, but Henry tends to burn out aide, so David's assigned this responsibility. David and Bud are going to run the plumbers. Gordon's there, basically with nothing to do, and he becomes the operational guy. And they're housed in the basement, because uh, uh, there isn't any other room in the old executive office building, so they're down there. Uh, uh, trying to figure out ways to uh, polygraph and discourage uh, government bureaucrats from leaking information. Uh, I've had felt and articulated to Bud that Gordon would cause troubles, uh, big troubles. Uh, shortly thereafter, uh, uh, the, the dates escape me, but in uh, November or December of uh, 1971, uh, uh, Gordon is reassigned uh, and goes over to the committee to reelect, which is starting up, mm -hmm. uh, and he's going to be their lawyer for the committee to reelect. Uh, and I remember walking down the hallway of the old executive office building, the gorgeous marble, black and white marble hallway, thinking to myself, you know, I threw such a hissy fit before he came. He's been here, and he's gone, and nothing has happened. Nothing that I predicted has happened. Bud must think I'm a fool. You know, I mean, they go running around like that. It's one of, one of two times I ever threw a hissy fit about doing things, and, and one of them was Gordon. And then, of course, we fast forward to the Watergate break-in, which I had nothing to do with me. I wasn't concerned about wasn't interested in. Uh, but one of our secretaries who had been detailed to work for the plumbers was sitting there, and the news was saying there's some people who weren't arrested, who haven't been identified, and they have, you know, the pressure's growing. And she said, you, you, you know who that is? And I said, no, I, I don't know anything about this. I'm not involved. I have other work I'm doing. And, and, and she said, well, let me give you his initials. It's GGL. And I said, doesn't mean anything to me. And then she said, it's G. Gordon. And I said, no. And then I said, oh, no. Oh, no. And it all came back. Well, it turned out to be far worse. He'd orchestrated the Ellsberg, the, the uh, break-in in Dr. Fielding's office. Uh, uh, he, he had done it not with FBI agents, because J. Edgar Hoover refused, uh, but with, uh, uh, I don't want to call them amateurs, with, with the Cuban group uh, on the side. So we were running out of the White House, a private army. Uh, uh, worse... It was supposed to be a black bag job. I mean, you, you can make a case. You, it may not be persuasive, but you can make a case for the break-in. Ellsberg had all these other papers. They didn't know what he was going to do. They consulted with his psychiatrist because they thought his psychiatrist, Dr. Lewis Fielding, would know. Fielding declined to comment. The thought was Fielding's notes of discussions may tell us, uh, and they wanted to see them. The CIA had done a psychological overview, uh, uh, it it uh, wasn't helpful. There wasn't any more. The FBI wouldn't go in. Gordon had some friends. Uh, they went in. 
couldn't pick the lock. Gordon is out on sight, and he instructs them to break in, fake like it was a drug, that, like people after drugs, scatter papers on the floor, everything else. Didn't find any files on Ellsberg, but it resulted in a police report. Now, if the FBI had gone in surreptitiously, you may not agree that it was legal, it was done for national security, you may not buy that argument either, but at least it wouldn't have been known. But with, a, with a, an event, breaking windows, scattering papers, there was a police report. So later, when it became disclosed, they could pinpoint the exact effort. They knew what they were going after. It was a real crime. And, and th this was Gordon's, and we, we, we lay it at Gordon's feet. Uh, Gordon did other things, and, and we'll, we'll come up with them. Uh, he, of course, helped orchestrate and, and plan the Watergate break-in. And then third, uh, he was reassigned as counsel to the uh, Finance Committee, and making decisions as counsel to the Finance Committee, he committed some uh, difficult situations that led to far greater trouble. He was. Uh, uh, washing, uh, laundering uh, campaign contributions, uh, and he did it through the same group who did the Watergate break-in later and had done the, the uh, fielding break-in before. So <clears throat> he managed to uh, get the White House involved in three uh, huge problems. Uh, uh, that is not what I would have predicted in my wildest imagination, but, but I have to tell you, I spent a lot of sleepless nights uh, uh, wondering if I couldn't have pushed harder uh, on avoiding Gordon Levy. We, we, we'd still have gotten into trouble, but we wouldn't have gotten into the kind of well, trouble we got into. Bud Krogh doesn't blame you. Bud Krogh probably doesn't remember. He probably doesn't remember. Uh, uh, it was a substantial argument. Uh, uh, Bud has no interest in remembering that there was a big fight over the hiring of Gordon Levy. Don Santarelli has no interest. If you talk to Don, he'll say, oh, I told Bud he had to supervise Gordon. I told him that Gordon would be fine, but he required very close supervision. Well, if he had said that, if he had said that, Bud would never have hired him because he, we, we couldn't afford that. We didn't need people on the White House staff who had to be watched. I mean, that was we were supposed to be the watchers, not the, not the people who needed, needed review. So that's when it started. As Bud got more and more involved with the plumbers, I did more and more policy work. Uh, and sometimes I wrote for Bud to sign, sometimes I wrote for John Ehrlichman to sign, but Bud was playing cops and robbers. I was doing the work of the domestic policy staff under his supervision, but we, we had worked out a modus operandi. He, he trusted what I wrote, and, and I was perfectly happy. Uh, I didn't need to know what they were doing. Uh, we'll have to do uh, more later, but I'd like to, today just to ask you how you got involved in transcribing tapes. Well, uh, uh, I'm associate director of the Domestic Council. Uh, my primary uh, working group is Department of Justice. So I know everybody involved in Watergate. I'm not involved, but I, they're all people I worked with or knew. <clears throat> I know their voices. I know their mannerisms. I know all that. Uh, when Ehrlichman, Haldeman, Dean, and Kleindings leave on April 30th, 1973, <clears throat> we had a new regime. The regime is Al Haig. Al Haig brings with him uh, the general counsel of the Department of Defense, J. Fred Bazaar. Fred's kind of there alone. Uh, uh, I'm pretty confident of myself. And a couple of times, I go down to see Fred, this young man whom he doesn't know, and ask him, in my own way, why we were doing such a crappy job defending the president. Why did, it, why did it keep getting worse? And these were not pleasant conversations for him or for me. But when he finally ran out of time, and he ran out of time on the tapes, he called and said, I have something for you to do. And, and it was because of these difficult conversations. And what he said was, we're going to have to turn over some of these tapes. And before we turn them over, we have to know what they say. We can't afford to give our opposition stuff we don't understand. Rosemary Woods has, and, and, and her assistant, Marge Acker, have done a yeoman's job in getting those words, getting the pattern, identifying the people. 
and they've done the hard work of knowing who's in the room. But you would understand the substance of the conversation. You must do this. He had set up adjacent to his office a room with a tape recorder. He brought me a tape. He said, here's the transcript. Polish the transcript. And I adjusted the headsets, and, you know, here's the transcript, and this was going to be fun. And it started up the tape machine. He pointed out the erase button had been disabled. Uh, uh, and I start listening. And I was waiting for the conversation to start, because there was this background noise. I'm waiting for the conversation to start. And after about 10 minutes, I realized that's the conversation. That the quality was so bad, you couldn't, you couldn't understand it. Now, there are three, three sets of tapes, three sets of quality on the tapes. There's the telephone taps, which are quite clear. There's only one person on the yeah. other line. You can pretty much tell what they're doing. There's the tapes in the Oval Office, where they're kind of sitting around the desk, and you can kind of hear. And there's the tapes in the hideaway office in the old executive office building, which were all but impossible to hear. Those turned out to be some of the most... Uh, uh, controversial tapes, because you just aren't sure what's on those tapes. Well, I had, at the time, very, very acute hearing. When I was in my induction physical for the U.S. Army, I was off the chart on, on uh, the ability to hear. Uh, and I could pick up stuff on the tapes, the nuances and that sort of thing. And it, it became a puzzle. And it was kind of like a novel. I mean, hearing those tapes. You just didn't know what they might say next. Fred had inside his coat pocket, inside his coat pocket, he had the footage of the most important tapes, the tapes, the original eight tapes that were subpoenaed by Dean. So he would say, no place else. It was handwritten. And he would say, Here's the, here is the tape. Go to 184 foot, wait for the beginning of the meeting. That's what I want you to transcribe. And it'll end about 100 feet later. Here's the rough draft. And I spent hundreds of hours. This must have been after the Saturday Night Massacre, of course. Yes, because we had agreed to turn them over. That He had no reason for me okay. until we had agreed to turn them over. Now, between the end of the Saturday Night Massacre, which is October uh, 1973. October 19th. And December, you produced transcripts or polished transcripts for those eight tapes. Yes. Do you do any other tapes? Uh, not at that time. Uh, uh, first, we did the eight because never they come into the court right. on the 21st or 22nd and say we're going to turn them over. So that was the crisis. Then Fred had gone on and identified other tapes because we were going to try to make the case that if you saw those eight in context, he would tell a certain story. So uh, he would identify and tell me what he wanted to transcribe. I'd always get a rough draft prepared by Rose or Marge, and I would be told, work on this. And we got up into December, we had a stack of transcripts about that thick, double-spaced, I mean, you know, because mm -hmm. in, in one side, where it was 40, 40 tapes, something like that. Uh, and we were geared up. We had turned them over to the special prosecutor. I believe Sereka had ordered them turned over to the Irvin Committee. So it was only a question of time as to when they leaked. And, and the issue was, how do, we, how do we handle this? Because they're going to leak. And the most significant take was the cancer on the presidency speech, which was very embarrassing. Now, Bazart heard other tapes, listened to other tapes. I, 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 uh, I think there was another subpoena. I don't have the date, but there's a, a subpoena the, for 64 later. tapes. Yeah, that comes later. Okay. But Bazart has looked at the logs. The logs were key because you needed to see what tapes you wanted. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's around the break-in and it's around other significant mm -hmm. events, the beginning of the trial and, and has to do with meetings with Polson, uh, uh, meetings with Ehrlichman. Uh, and we, we worked up a, a batch about that thick. And <clears throat> we were going to release them. In December? In December. And that would be December of 1973. They were ultimately released in April of 74. And we were working with Al Haig and Bryce Harlow. Bryce Harlow had come back to help the president mm -hmm. as counselor. <clears throat> and I staffed him on the Watergate issue. So I spent a lot of time 
with Bryce, Bryce Harlow, who was one prince of a guy. And at one point, we gave Bryce, Al Haig, maybe one other person a set. And Bryce said to me one cheerful morning, he said, I walked in to see Al Haig yesterday, and I told him that he and I should be fired. He said, yep, told him he and I should be fired. I said, why is that? I mean, you guys are the most critical people we have. And he said, because we have recommended to the president that he release these tapes. And Al Haig and I have not spent the time really reading them. We don't know what they say. We're relying on Fred. And that's not what the president wants. He wants our view. So we've put this off until we can really read them. Uh, I then went around and picked up all of the transcripts, however many copies there were that were made, and took them personally with a shopping cart uh, uh, down to the burn room for the NSC that the NSC ran. They have one of the greatest uh, uh, mulchers of documents. You know, it cuts it 64 strips this way, 64 strips that way, introduces water and mixes it so that there's no way you're going to see it. Because we didn't want uh, uh, the possibility of different transcripts coming out about these tapes, and we certainly didn't want them coming out piecemeal. So we handled that while we were going to think about it by collecting them. And the issue was put off. I kept polishing. There were some added, some taken off. Until April 30th, we published. On, on, on the 29th, the president addresses the nation there's a bunch of black binders behind him. He says, I'm going to turn over the tapes to the House Judiciary. Tomorrow, they go up. All night, we ran a, a single Xerox machine that reproduced, and the government GSA, or the government printing office, bound a, a number of these blue books. And, and that's my book. I didn't bring it with me. But <clears throat> that blue book is my transcripts of, of all of the tapes the White House was prepared to release. Fred Bazart did the first 50 pages, which was the analysis. Here's what this tape says. Here's what the president did. But it's my transcripts. Then, right. then that's uh, published by, by two paperbacks, and that's out. Uh, are you the one who gave us the term expletive deleted? Expletive deleted. deleted. I am indeed. I am the expletive deleter. Um, it's funny how it developed. Everybody thought president was swearing like a fishwife, uh, and he wasn't. Uh, uh, he wasn't, he, he did not have colorful language. But what he had done, advertently or inadvertently, he had fallen into, uh, when he was trying to emphasize a point, of using the phrase goddamn. So if he was instructing Ehrlichman to do something, he would say, take the goddamn chair and put it outside the room. And it appeared with great frequency. But I think with three exceptions, th that was the only swearing on there. Well, the president wanted it removed because the president shouldn't say goddamn. And I said to Bizarre, you know, the trouble is that's an adjective. And if you remove that, people will think he's using another word. He's using the F word, and the president's not. Why don't we just remove the word God and just have the blank damn chair? You know, it's not that bad. It went back up. Answer came back down, don't nope, remove it all, because they'll know what I said. In his view, raised in a Quaker family, uh, uh, Ten Commandments, thou shalt not use the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And his view was that was a worse sin than uh, uh, colorful swearing. So it went out to the world as expletive deleted and got huge headlines. Everybody was curious. They thought this, they thought the man in private. I mean, the, the, the tapes were not Nixon's proudest moment. He thought, as all of us, uh, uh, out loud. And, and he said things that, that he didn't think would see the light of day that he came to regret, the White House regretted. Uh, there was something else in those tapes that was far more critical. And it didn't appear as often, but it said material unrelated to presidential decisions omitted. And that was stuff Bazart took out at express presidential instruction. If the president said, I said that, but that didn't have anything to do with Watergate, that got pulled. 
And some of that stuff came back to bite us, and that's where the special prosecutor said, you've been, you were messing with the tapes. Those are not accurate transcripts. They don't mean you, you, you left out stuff you didn't mark. It's you marked it, but you left out key stuff. And the, the tapes became a huge controversy. So first thing I did for Bazaar, I transcribed the tapes. That evolved into running the document rooms. Uh, they seized all of the files by the uh, jilted White House staff, and they were concentrated in room 422 and, and another room on the first floor. And they put a safe door on the front. And those were the only people allowed in. The lawyer couldn't go in. Uh, I had to be there, and the Secret Service had to be there. They couldn't copy it. They could go into the inner sanctum, look at a piece of paper, come out, copy it down, take that copy out to see their lawyer. It was hugely frustrating. Nobody did it except Ehrlichman, and only for half a day, and he walked out and said, I can't, I can't function. I can't even find what I need to find to defend myself. But I ran the document rooms under express instructions. I briefed the senior staff, uh, Bryce Harlow and Dean Birch, in turn. Uh, I did whatever Fred asked me to do, but uh, amazingly, it never was in writing, and my work product was just given right back to Fred. And, and Fred was not a talkative guy. He was not a sharing individual. He just, here's your instruction, go get to work, come back when you're done. He was very busy. He worked incredibly hard. Had a heart attack. He was 52. No man in his family had ever lived past 50. Uh, he told me when he woke up with a heart attack, he gave serious thought to not waking his wife because it was under such duress. Uh, well, my, my uh, duties expanded exponentially when he had his heart attack. I did a whole lot more. Uh, we, we took some stuff out to the hospital, and he said, don't tell him at the front desk you're here to see me. There's some stuff he had to see, had to do. So I just took it to his room, disappeared, you know. I mean, I don't, I'm 6'6", six, six, I don't fit in. But he told me the next day I had been seen, that, that his, his room was being watched. Uh, and I don't know if it was being watched by the Department of Defense or the FBI or the CIA, but uh, he was an asset, and they were, they were worried about him. I don't think it was an unfriendly watch, but it was watched. I was the official representative to the Supreme Court argument. Uh, remember, the White House is the defendant, and, and when, they, when the oral argument was held, they, they need somebody who's representing the entity. There's a wood screen where notorious people can go watch the argument without it being known they're there, and I watched. I'm um, admitted to practice before the Supreme Court, but I decided it would be safer <laughs> on the side. Uh, I took documents up to the uh, evidentiary hearing that Sarekta was contemplating to deliver to Bazart, sneaking in and out as best my size could. Uh, I helped orchestrate, oh, I was, uh, when, the, when the Supreme Court decided uh, uh, it was the only time Bazard opened up, and we'll, we'll skim over this quickly, but uh, one minute. Uh, let's, stop for, let's stop for a minute, because okay. I, what I wanted to do is I want you to change the tape. Okay. And Um, Bazart opens up to you for the first time after U.S. v. Nixon. Uh, uh, U.S. v. Nixon is an 8-zip. Rehnquist recused himself. Uh, President and uh, Haig and Jim St. Clair are at San Clemente. Bazart and I are alone in the White House. Uh, Bazart receives an instruction via Al Haig uh, to go check out and listen to a couple tapes. Uh, uh, he hears what later became the smoking gun, and uh, uh, he is going to report back to Al Haig uh, and Nixon what he heard. Uh, make a long story short, Bazart gets scared because the tape is not ambiguous, and he needs a witness that he, what he did. So he invites me down, and for 45 minutes we just talked. And I didn't realize it, but he's stalling till the call comes back from San Clemente so he can report on the conversation. So I get, it's just incredible insight into what he thought, where we were going, what was going to happen. Uh, uh, and then I'm, that I hear his description of the tape and then he instructs me to transcribe it. 
So I transcribe the smoking gun tape. I'm the one that calls it the smoking gun. Fred would never call it the smoking gun. And as, as you recall, it's uh, June 23rd, and Nixon is, is uh, encouraged to authorize the CIA to uh, uh, tell the FBI to lay off interviews with two people, and the president concurs. It's clear. It's unambiguous. It's an obstruction of justice. Uh, the release of that tape led to Nixon's resignation. I'm in the East Room when he gives the speech. I'm on the South Lawn when he takes off. Uh, uh, I help wrap up matters, and then I stay on Fort Staff for six months, and then I, I vacate the premises. I become a witness in the Plumbers trial because I handled documents, uh, and I'm subpoenaed to be a witness in the Watergate cover-up trial because I handled the tapes. And, and the, the handling of certain tapes is, is key to the foundation of their entry, but uh, uh, they, uh, they move admission just before I'm supposed to take the stand, so I don't have to take the stand in the cover-up trial. So that's, that's my involvement in Watergate with one other final exception, and then I think we'll, we'll bring this to a close. Uh, I, uh, there was controversy over the transcripts, and it was not easy for me to find employment because I had been so close and so involved. So I possess a letter from the special prosecutor uh, that's in the files. I have a copy of it here. Uh, uh, that the operative paragraph says, after checking with my task forces, I'm able to state you are not and have never been the object of an investigation of this office, which is a certification of innocence in its own way. There are only two letters that exist like that. Walt Minnick has the other for members of the White House staff. Uh, uh, there are other people who were not connected mm -hmm. at all, but we were right in the eye of the storm. Uh, uh, it, it, it constantly surprises me that I walked through uh, not only the stuff that caused the break-in and, and led to this difficulty, but the entire cover-up and then the entire defense. And, and it's like walking through a forest fire, you know, and friends uh, self emulating to your right and to your left, and you emerge the other side unscathed. I mean, psychologically unscathed. It, I, I can't let go of this. But uh, uh, I was such a Boy Scout, and I had no interest by fluke or by, by dint of good living where I wasn't involved, I wasn't a suspect. Now, later time we'll talk about how close I came, but that was it. Now, one other thing, and then, and then we'll stop. The smoking gun drove Nixon from office, the publication of the smoking gun. But before we get to that, yes. what, did, what did, if I may, Fred Bozard say to you about the smoking gun? He was not, he was upset. It's a 45-minute conversation. I have it written out. I think that's a topic for far more detail. Uh, he felt he could no longer defend the president. Uh, he felt that he was able to defend as long as there was nothing that was, was not there could be ambiguity on the tapes, but he was assuring everyone that there was nothing there. And when he came across the smoking gun, he could not assure other people that there was nothing there. And, and he, was, he was an advocate of Nixon resigning uh, 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 and not disclosing the tapes, that, that to save executive privilege, what he should do. He had it all worked out. Uh, he should pardon everybody involved in Watergate. That would moot the case, destroy the tapes to preserve the sanctity of the Oval Office, and resign. And I said, well, he'd never do that unless, uh, uh, unless he was pardoned. You know, this is a long conversation. Uh, and he said, well, I just happen to have the uh, draft of the pardon right here in my pocket. This is the same pocket that had the notations <laughs> of the six or eight tapes. Uh, it, it's a – I don't think Bizarre talked to anybody else. I don't think he talked to Woodward or Bernstein about this. I think I had a tremendously unique catbird seat at the moment of the collapse of the presidency, uh, and we're going to save that for a later. Do you think he talked? Do you think he talked to Ford about it? No, no. I have studied it extraordinarily closely. St. Clair did. Bizarre never spoke to Ford. But St. Clair talked to Ford. St. Clair talked to Ford. It's very clear in Ford's testimony that there were different points of view, different options, and that uh, once the tape became public, Ford, Ford didn't want to be involved in it anymore at all. But, but what Bazart wanted to do 
was do that instead of disclosure. And he was so pissed at St. Clair he couldn't see straight. And he said, if I had been there or they had been here, I could have won. But St. Clair hadn't heard the tape. He didn't know how bad it was. And he's the one who decided that the He's the one that assured Nixon we could handle this. And that it should be disclosed. No problem at all. It's not, but, but if Nixon, I mean, but if Nixon, at that point, since it had been subpoenaed, if that tape had been destroyed at that point. Oh, no, no, no. You, you, you forget the scenario. I have pardoned everybody in Watergate. That's my right. I have prerogatives as president. And then I, but then Ford had to pardon him then. Uh, it was my point that he would have to be pardoned, but he would resign. Always before Nixon, if a public official hadn't stolen money, if a public official resigned, that was the end of it. You didn't pursue them into the grave. So it was pardon, wow. uh, un, unfettered constitutional right to pardon. Moots the case, no longer evidence, because there's no case. Need to protect the sanctity of conversations in the Oval Office. This is far more important to me than my presidency or these prosecutions. No president can function in advance. So I, I do that, and then I resign. And St. Clair at that point, was he in San Clemente? Yes, as the president. And, that's where the, and that was where the decision was made. Well, you remember, there's a gap. The, the Supreme Court rules... Eight hours of silence, and the White House had never said they'd concur. They never said they'd agree with the Supreme Court. It was quite a cause to have. And there's eight hours of silence while it's fought tooth and nail over what to do. And Bazart loses. And tapes become public. You're releasing tapes, what, within another... Uh, another 80 hours of tape or 80 154 tapes? hours. 154 Four hours, hours are coming next, out. Yeah, yeah, next month. Yeah. Uh, scholars love it. I, I just, uh, I think it is so wrong that he taped and so wrong they've become become public. Uh, I, I, uh, uh, I rue the day they put in the system and, and didn't tell anybody. Um, with that, we will end this and we'll continue it another day Look because forward. there's a lot more to say and a lot more to uh, preserve for history. Look forward to Thank, it. You, Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Take this thing off. Gentlemen.